Hello, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Trump supports Israeli settlement building. Israeli troops are attacked on the Gaza border. And ILTV takes a closer look at Poland 70 years after the Holocaust. I'm Denise Wood here with the latest news in Israel. America is buzzing with the news that Donald Trump is blazing a path to the Republican nomination and gaining on Hillary Clinton. It turns out he's also been making some important statements about Israel, and you'll want to hear them. Donald Trump has now all but clinched the Republican presidential nomination. Trump won the Indiana primary, and his main opponent, Ted Cruz, has now dropped out of the race, leaving Trump with a clear road to the nomination. When I got back tonight and I started watching all of the different networks, I could see immediately that we were doing very well, and it really looks like a massive victory, and looks like we win all 57 delegates as, yeah! as far as. Yeah! And uh, we had a tremendous victory tonight. It was a tremendous victory. And I, get, I have to thank Bobby Knight. Boy, Bobby Knight was incredible. He was incredible. I always say about, you know, people like that, there aren't many, but it's called tough, smart, and they know how to win. And that's what our country needs. We have to win again. We have to know how to win. And we haven't won. We've been losing all the time. We lose with our military. We can't beat ISIS. We lose with, lose with trade. We lose with borders. We lose with everything. We're not going to lose. We're going to start winning again, and we're going to win bigly. Yeah. Yeah. But not only that, Trump is also gaining on Democratic frontrunner Hillary Clinton. And in a recent poll by NBC News, 43% of respondents said they would vote for Clinton, and 37% said they'd vote for Trump, putting him within six percentage points of the lead. And in some polls, he's already ahead of Clinton. Uh, the Rasmussen poll came out yesterday, and in that poll, I'm now leading Hillary Clinton. A lot of good things are happening. We're now leading Hillary Clinton by two points. Now that Trump is making big gains in the presidential race, he's also coming out with a lot of comments about Israel. When asked if Israel should pause its settlement building, he said they should keep working on it, and even linked settlement building with the rockets fired at Israel from Gaza. Trump claims Hamas is firing thousands of rockets at Israel, and says the Jewish state shouldn't have to put up with that. But despite support for Israel's settlement building, Trump says he'd like to restart peace talks, even though the Palestinians say Israel must stop before negotiations can resume. The Republican candidate also called on Israel to keep moving forward with its response to Arab terror. Trump has also emphasized his support for the Jewish state and is veering away from previous comments he made about staying neutral on the Arab-Israeli conflict. He also admits that he doesn't know Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu very well, but that he thinks they could have a very good relationship. Trump claims Obama has been very bad to Israel, and he thinks Netanyahu is a really good guy. Things are heating up on the Gaza border, and Hamas is apparently gearing up to fight against Israel. This morning, IDF soldiers came under fire while patrolling along the Gaza border, which is the latest in a series of escalations this week. No one was injured, and the soldiers returned fire, damaging a post belonging to Hamas's military wing without injuring anyone. Yesterday, shots also were fired at an Israeli army vehicle from the Gaza Strip. Again, no one was injured, but the fire seriously damaged IDF engineering machinery and the army is still looking for the shooter. No one has claimed the attack, which comes as tensions are rising between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Israel hasn't said what kind of machinery was damaged, but the army frequently uses earth-moving equipment to locate and destroy Hamas tunnels along the border. The attack came only hours after Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Moshe Yaalon visited soldiers on the border. Netanyahu praised the relative quiet along the border since the 2014 war, and praise the soldiers for working to keep their country safe. Israel also revealed yesterday that it stopped attempts to smuggle shipments of ammonium chloride into Gaza in recent weeks. The chemical is mostly used in fertilizer, but it's also used to make explosives, and it could have been used to make hundreds of rockets. 
Israel says it found more than four tons of the chemical, buried in salt shipments to the Gaza Strip. The tax authority said it originally became suspicious when a Hamas-linked importer placed an order for 36 tons of salt. And Israel's security forces believe the shipment would have been used by Hamas to produce long-range rockets. Unfortunately, this week we've seen an upswing in terror attacks, despite the recent period of relative calm. Yesterday, a Palestinian terrorist injured three Israeli soldiers, and they're still recovering in the hospital. The Israeli soldiers were wounded in a car ramming attack last night in the West Bank, and they're now recovering in an Israeli hospital. Other soldiers shot and killed the terrorist after he drove his van into a checkpoint between the Israeli communities of Dolev and Talmon. The wounded soldiers are from the Kfir Brigade and are between the ages of 21 and 22 years old. Two of the injured soldiers were taken to the hospital in moderate condition, but the third soldier was more seriously wounded and was airlifted to a hospital from the scene of the attack. Israeli authorities have already released the body of the dead terrorist to the Palestinian Authority. The attacker has been identified as 36-year-old Ahmed Shahada from a town near Ramallah. The incident follows an attack on Monday when an 18-year-old Palestinian terrorist stabbed an Israeli man in Jerusalem's old city. The ultra-Orthodox victim was moderately wounded in his upper body, but is now in stable condition. Tonight marks the start of Holocaust Remembrance Day in Israel. But even as we remember the Holocaust, Jews all over the world today face a rise in anti-Semitism. Gidon Bachar is the head of the Foreign Ministry's Department for Combating Anti-Semitism. And at LTV, Steve Levovich sat down with him to discuss how the Israeli government is working to fight the trend. In the last 15 years or so, we have seen a significant rise in anti-Semitism, especially in Western Europe today, in countries like France, like Sweden, Belgium, Hungary, Greece, anti-Semitism is significantly on the rise. Unfortunately, we see it every day, every day. There is no day passing without any anti-Semitic incidents in, in Europe. But is there anything that you could describe as anti-Israel attitudes without it being called anti-Semitism? Yes, of course. <clears throat> we can see how the lines between anti-Israel or criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism, these lines are blurred. They are not clear anymore. We see, we are witnessing how the BDS, the, 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 this movement that calls for the boycott of Israel, is becoming a major source of anti-Semitism today against Jewish communities in Europe. They produce anti-Semitism against Jewish communities who live in Europe or against uh, Jewish students in different campuses in the United States. We see also how anti-Semitism is diversing itself. It's, you know, it's like a virus. It mutates. It has mutations. In the past, it used to be anti-Semitism that used to come from the uh, Christian world, religious anti-Semitism. But today we are witnessing significant rise of Islamic anti-Semitism. Actually, 11 Jews were killed in recent years in Europe by Islamic radicals, by Islamic anti-Semitism, whether it's in France, in the super hyper kasher, whether it's in Copenhagen, or the Jewish Museum in Brussels, or the Jewish school in Toulouse in France. Another major source of anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism coming from the far right, the radical right in Europe. For instance, the Yobbik party in Hungary, which is a neo-Nazi, neo-fascist party. We see also anti-Semitism coming from uh, places like uh, Greece, where the neo-Nazi neo party, the Golden Dawn, is also a significant political force. So anti-Semitism is coming from different places today. I may include also anti-Semitism, which is coming from the left, as we see today in Great Britain, uh, with all of these uh, declarations coming from various uh, figures and people within the Labour Party. This is very unfortunate, and we are expecting <coughs> the Labour Party, the leadership of the Labour, Labour Party, to reconsider what's going on inside the party and to condemn immediately these this incitement or these, uh, these anti-Semitic expressions which exist within the party and distance itself from these, uh, these worldviews of anti-Semitism and discrimination against Israel. So what can we in Israel really be doing about these different forms of anti-Semitism? I know that Isaac Herzog, the leader of the Zionist Union Party, invited leaders of uh, the Labour Party to come here to Israel to visit Yad Vashem. Will, does that help or what helps? Well, many things should help, but we must first of all and foremost convey that message that anti-Semitism is not only a Jewish problem 
anti-Semitism is an international problem because it affects the foundations of democracy. It affects the foundations of the free world. You know, all the, the norms, all the values that we share together as a free world are threatened by anti-Semitism. And people who fight anti-Semitism must understand that by doing so, they are protecting their own environment, their own civilization, because everything, you know, everything that starts with the Jews never stops there. It never ends with the Jews. It starts with, with the Jews, but it will continue to other minorities till it affects the society in large. If we do not fight this anti-Semitism, we all as a society will be in a problem because anti-Semitism is exactly a canary in a coal mine. It's an alarm bell. Anti-Semitism pops up. It comes only, mainly, when there are deeper problems in a society or a country. For instance, political problems, social problems, economical problems or economical crisis, then anti-Semitism is rising. And this is exactly the situation today that we see in Europe of economic crisis, problems with immigration, political problems vis-a-vis -vis the European Union, etc. And anti-Semitism is rising. If you've ever created a presentation for school or work, you know how challenging it can be to keep your audience engaged. They can also be incredibly complicated to design, especially when you have data to manage or if you're working with a team of people. The Israeli company Emace has come up with a website to streamline the whole process. And their CEO, Moti Nisani, is here to tell us how they help you transform your presentation into a work of art. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Denise. So first of all, what is Emace? Emez is uh, the new era of a presentation tool. It's an online presentation website that helps you create really high-end designed presentation, engaging presentation really easily. You don't have to know any graphic design skills because the Emez software will do everything for you. For example, you can take even an existing PowerPoint presentation and transform it into uh, amazing, an amazing presentation automatically and our software and algorithms will do all the design work for you. Wow, fantastic. And so this is all online, you can do it right from your house. Exactly, it's all online, all working from the browser, you don't need to install anything on your computer. It works on any platform, if it's a PC, it's a laptop or a, <coughs> or a desktop uh, uh, or a tablet, sorry, or a tablet uh, uh, device. Uh, you can also watch the presentation on mobile and you can watch the presentation on uh, your desktop. It's all based on HTML5 technology, which is the technology of sure. the web, as you know. Oh, fantastic. So how is this different than other presentation tools that are on the market? Basically, Emaze put a lot of emphasis on the design and the ability for the user to create really high-end professional design presentation easily. And also uh, <coughs> with Emaze, uh, the user can easily collaborate and share his presentation with other. You can basically embed any uh, widget that lives on the internet, like a YouTube movie or even a website or, or a Twitter ticket on your website, just with a copy paste uh, of a link because everything is live on, on the web. Also, you may you may have really uh, different designs than PowerPoint. For example, you can create a 3D presentation oh, wow. in Emaze that you actually can move in a world um, and basically see your slides uh, on the walls, stuff that you cannot do with, uh, uh, with PowerPoint. And of course, the ability to automatically design your presentation and give you guidance on you know, how to build your presentation really, really good. Definitely a helping hand when you need it. Exactly. So who would you recommend this tool for? Who would you say should use it? So basically, mainly our uh, 4 million users that we have today are coming from professional uh, business uh, that basically have the, the need to create uh, professional presentation but don't have the resources or the capability in-house in their company. So freelancers and small businesses use Emez a lot. Also we are very strong in the education market, mainly in the, in the States where student and teacher create uh, presentations for the studies. Definitely. So it sounds like a very unique idea that you came up with. How did you think of it? Basically, it came from a personal need. You know, I was uh, a businessman working with a large corporation here in, uh, in Israel. And I was working on deals and, you know, we we're going into a bid process when many companies come into the customer and, and uh, presenting their solution 
to, to the customer and everybody coming with PowerPoint and everybody basically looks the same and then you have to fight on the price. And then one day I had an idea, let's come with something different. And then I started to, to uh, uh, build presentation with Flash, you know, but it took a lot of time and a lot of coding. But when I came in to the room and presented with this Flash tool that uh, we created, it was amazing, you know, the customer was like, oh, you know, they are different. They are, they are, this, this is the company that I want to work with. And then I said, okay, we need to take it to the market, you know, we need to, to take the idea of uh, creating really engaging and amazing presentation, but easily to the whole world. Definitely. Well, it sounds like an amazing product and something everyone can use. Thank Definitely. you so much for Thank coming you. in. Thank you very much, Denise. Israel is preparing for Holocaust Memorial Day, and ILTV's Natasha Kerchak is in Poland to commemorate the lives of those who were lost. Her first stop is in Kharkov, and she already has a lot to say. I'm here in Krakow, Poland, on a journey to remember the lives of the six million Jews who were lost in the Holocaust. On this three-day journey, we'll be taking a look into the past of this beautiful country, and I'll be rediscovering my own family roots. I hope you'll join us on this emotional journey. Krakow is the second largest city in Poland, and it also happens to be one of the oldest. The city dates back to the 7th century, but I'm here to learn about it during a different part of its history, World War II. During the Holocaust, Nazis adopted Krakow as their colonial capital, and they forced the city's Jewish population into a walled area known as a Krakow ghetto. They were eventually sent to German extermination camps, never to return. I'm here in the square of the heroes of the ghetto, and this is where thousands of Jews were lined up every day to be assembled and deported to concentration camps in the surrounding area. You can actually see that there are chairs, empty chairs that symbolize the emptiness of the square and the loss of life that ex was experienced here every day. Over 15,000 Jews were crammed into the ghetto, which previously housed just 3,000 citizens. On average, four Jewish families were made to live in one small apartment, while many others ended up living in the street. Well, it's definitely really emotional. My family, my descendants are definitely from here. And just knowing, you know, that I'm in the same land that they lived in, on the same, you know, land they walked on, it's just, it's a crazy feeling, you know? My family is from here, um, from towns right outside of uh, Krakow. Many of them, of course, were, were killed. And uh, it's hard to get pleasure um, uh, uh, without it being mixed with deep, deep pain. When you think of the thriving Jewish life that existed here for a thousand years and how quickly it ended, it makes us all appreciate what we have and also worry and prepare for eventualities in the future. After experiencing the darkness of the Krakow ghetto, we headed over to Krakow's old Jewish quarter. Today, the Jewish quarter is a thriving neighborhood for both locals and tourists. But it wasn't always that way. What's interesting is that around us you see these beautiful restaurants and cafes. They actually didn't pop up until Steven Spielberg came here to film Schindler's List, one of the most popular movies about the Holocaust. Until then, this area was just completely ruined and there was nothing here to show for it. Well, this is the first time I've really been here since the renewal of the Jewish community uh, uh, area. In 1995, the then president of Israel, uh, Ezra Weitzman, said at an event there was no future for Jewish life in Krakow or Poland. And I think he's been proved wrong and I think we have to capitalize on uh, improving Jewish life um, everywhere in the world. This is a perfect example of a community rising from the ashes. The Jewish Quarter may be a hotspot for non-Jewish tourism, but tour guides say the Jewish Quarter even has a growing Jewish community. Before the population of Krakow was 65,000, I mean Jewish population, 65,000. Every fourth person in this city was Jewish. Uh, we don't have it now. But still, Krakow is not dead. There is some Jewish life, very limited, but this is it is thriving. I keep on asking everybody around me what did they expect when they came to this this dark yet beautiful place and I'm finding that I I don't know how I feel yet you know it's a process trying to understand whether or not I value the fact that Jewish tradition is being celebrated here or whether or not it's right for this area to look the way that it does after so much tragedy took place here. For me, Poland is not beautiful. There's nothing beautiful about it. For me, 
Poland is a big cemetery and what you go through is seven, eight hundred years of Jewish life that could have been beautiful, but now who is keeping that Jewish life, those who killed us? It may be strange to see a revival of the old Jewish quarter, but some claim it's a positive thing. Do you feel that rebuilding these areas is a means through which that, you know, we can remember the Jewish people? Well, it's more than just remembering the Jewish people. We have to revive the Jewish sparks and roots that still exist in Poland. A significant number of people who are alive today in Poland have some uh, Jewish roots. That's true not only in Poland, it's true in Spain, it's true in Portugal, it's true in Holland, it's true in many parts of the world that it's important to revive that. I myself have Polish roots, and I'm going to explore them in the coming days. Join me tomorrow as ILTV continues to honor our loved ones lost to the Holocaust. This is Natasha Kierczak reporting from Krakow, Poland. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. Today's word is a difficult one, but it's very important. Today we're learning about the word Shoah, which means Holocaust in Hebrew. We're teaching you this word because tonight is the start of Holocaust Remembrance Day in Israel. Because Israel runs according to the Jewish calendar, holidays begin the night before the actual date of the event. Memories of the Shoah run deep in Israeli society, as well as with Jews around the world. The Shoah was one of the main catalysts for the creation of a Jewish state, and around 200,000 Holocaust survivors are still living today in Israel. The word and the day are both deep and difficult, but Israelis believe it's important to keep the memory of the Holocaust alive, to keep it from ever happening again. Israel will broadcast a siren around the country tomorrow morning to call for a moment of silence in memory of those who were lost. Let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Today it's partly cloudy with a high of 74 in Tel Aviv. Tomorrow there should be sunny skies with a high of 76 degrees. All right, everybody, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.78 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. And don't forget to check out our evening update every night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching and see you tonight.